Yo, what is up, Spectrum? Let's make some noise. Who is excited to be in the house tonight? That's good. Man, welcome to Spectrum. I am so happy that you are here tonight. There's a lot of places you could have been. I'm honored that you chose to join us. Uh, I am happy that you've chosen to be here. My name is Taylor. If we haven't met yet, uh, I would love to get to know you. I'd love to talk with you after we're done tonight. Uh, we are very passionate here at Spectrum about the idea that you can belong here in this family even if you don't believe yet. You can belong before you believe. And no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, what you think, how you identify, uh, this is a safe place for you. This family is a safe place for you. We will always make room for you, no matter who you are. But I also just want to speak to a lot of you who I know you have been coming to Spectrum for a long time. You come to Spectrum every week. I know that some of you, you are seniors. You've been in Spectrum since you came in as a sixth grader. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here week in, week out. This community is better because you are here. I mean it. This community is better because you show up every week. Spectrum is not a family because I say it's a family. Spectrum is not a family because your leaders tell you that it's a family or that we put that it's a family on social media. Spectrum is a family because you make it a family. Spectrum is a family because you make it a family. You make this community a better place simply by being here. So I'm thanking you for that. I'm thanking you that, that you show up week in, week out, and that you turn this place into a safe place, that you always make room for those who are here, even if it's their first time. Thank you. And I, I, this, this is going to sound sentimental. I don't care, but I mean it. Um, aside from being a husband and being a father, the greatest honor of my life is to be here every week, to, to have a front row seat to what the Spirit of God is doing in and through you. I mean that. It is the greatest honor of my life outside of being a husband and a dad that I get to be here every week and I have a front row seat to what God is doing in your midst. It's incredible. And I love that I get to be a part of it, that I just get to see it. So with that in mind, I just want to say that I love you, Spectrum. I, I can't make it more simple. I love you, Spectrum. I'm so grateful for you. I love you more. <laughs> so with that, if you have a Bible with you, I hope you do, or you have a Bible app, please turn with me. We are going to be in the book of Colossians chapter one tonight. We are continuing in our series, Jesus Saves. As you can tell by the screen behind me that says that, we are in week three of this series, and we have been looking at the letter of Paul to the Colossian church. We've been going through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And tonight's actually something of a milestone in this series. We are finishing chapter one. Chapter one is honestly the kind of the chewiest chapter to get through. It's going to be a little bit smoother sailing after this. But we say it all the time that here at Spectrum, we are a Jesus family. We are a Jesus family. We're a Jesus family. We're doing a series called Jesus Saves. We love Jesus. We follow Jesus. We try to obey what Jesus says. Uh, we, we try to follow and live our lives the way Jesus would. And if you're still exploring faith in Jesus right now, if you're 
still trying to decide if you want to follow Jesus or not, that is okay. Again, I just cannot tell you how welcome you are here. We're glad that you are here. This is a safe place to ask questions, to observe, and to just to explore your faith in greater depth. But as a Jesus family, we are convinced that following Jesus is the greatest adventure that exists. We believe that following Jesus, that choosing to allow Jesus to be king over your life is the answer to what you've been looking for. I believe that wholeheartedly. But we also believe something here in Spectrum is that as a family, you can't follow Jesus unless you know Jesus. You can't follow Jesus unless you know Jesus. That's why we're going through this series. It's not enough to pray, although that's essential. It's not enough to worship, although that is needed. It's not enough just to go to church, to come to Spectrum, to go to connect groups. All of those are so essential, but that is not enough by itself. You have to learn about Jesus in the Bible. We believe that this book, it is not just a book. We believe that this is the word of God, that God is literally revealing himself to us in this book. That's why we study it every week. And last week, we went through one of the most challenging, most complex, most poetic passages in all of Scripture. And I know that that was a lot to take in, right? Last week was a lot of really theology, deep theology to try to cover. You guys were up to it. Thankfully, this week is going to be much simpler, much more practical. Uh, we are actually only looking at about six verses. However, in the grand scheme of this book, these are actually some of my favorite verses in the whole book. Honestly, they may be even some of my favorite verses in the whole New Testament. So, we talked about last week how Jesus saves our worship, right? Jesus saves our worship. We believe that we were created to worship, that no matter who you are, what you believe, you are worshiping something. That's what we believe, that Jesus saves our worship. And Colossians 15 through 1, 15 through 23 is in the Bible. Specifically, we know who we are worshiping. We need to read that passage so we know the real Jesus. We don't want to worship a fake Jesus. We don't want to worship somebody who looks kind of like Jesus but isn't Jesus. We need the real Jesus, and that's what last week was about. We talked about how the gospel is for us. It's for our benefit, but it is not about us. The gospel is not about you. The gospel is not about me. The gospel is about Jesus. But now... You may be asking, okay, I get who Jesus is. I understand that. I know who Jesus is. Thank you so much. Why am I here? Why am I here? What is my purpose on this planet? And that question right there, that is one of the most fundamental questions that every human being will ever ask. Why am I here? What is my purpose? I know that many of you in this room are asking that question tonight. Why am I here? For some of you, maybe you are not quite sure what your purpose is. You know you have one. You know that school and friends and, and sports and, and video games, like those are cool, but that's not your purpose. You, you're aware of that. I think for some of you also, you had a purpose. You had a direction. You had a trajectory in your life that you were going on, but then a year of lockdowns and social distancing and quarantining took that purpose away from you. And I also know for a fact that some of you in this room, you don't feel like you have a purpose at all. You don't believe that you even have a purpose in existing. Maybe you believe that you are here on this earth by accident. Maybe that's what you believe. And if one of those applies to you, if one of those statements applies to you or that resonates with where you are in your journey, I strongly believe that this word is for you. This word is for you. If you walked in here tonight without a purpose, my prayer is that you would walk out with one. If you walked in here tonight, you'd feel like you did not have a purpose or you're not sure what that is. I want you to walk out tonight knowing what your purpose is. Because I believe that each of you, each one of you, whether you want to be here or not, is here for a purpose, that you were born on purpose. You may believe that you are an accident in this world, and my friends, that, it, that could not be farther from the truth. You are here on purpose. And it's because of that that I want to share a talk with you tonight that I'm calling Jesus Saves Your Purpose. Jesus Saves Your Purpose. Let's start our text. We're in chapter 1, verse 24. I'll start. Let's go. Now, this is Paul speaking, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. 
I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this family. I thank you that everybody in here was created by you with a purpose and that they have a purpose in life that you have called them to live out. I know that there are those of us in here who may be doubting what that purpose is. Maybe, maybe we're wondering if we even have a reason for existing, God. I pray that you would encourage us tonight. I pray that we would walk away knowing what our purpose is, knowing that you have a plan for us. I pray that we would focus, that we would pay attention, that we would not miss the message that you want to speak to us. We thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I believe that each of you, each of you, every single one of you in this room was born on purpose for a purpose. You are born on purpose for a purpose. No matter what you think or believe, you are not here on this earth by accident. You are not here by accident. However, just as with every other aspect of our lives, we need Jesus to come in tonight. We need him to save our purpose. Because at some point in your life, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, at some point in your life, you're going to believe one of these two things. At some point in your life, you will be tempted to believe that you do not have a purpose. You will be tempted to believe, maybe that's you right now, that you do not have a purpose, that you are an accident. And then at other points in your life, you will believe that your purpose is something other than what it actually is. You will either believe that you do not have a purpose or that you will believe that your purpose is something other than what you have been created for. And that's why we need to invite Jesus into our everyday lives to adjust, if needs be, what our purpose is so that we can live according to how we were designed. And just like we talked about last week, you were created for Jesus. You were created for Jesus. And now, tonight... It's time to allow your creator to give you back the purpose that you were designed to have. You need to invite Jesus back in to give you the purpose that he designed you to have. And I believe that this passage, these six verses that we have just read, give us three steps to understanding what our, our, our purpose in this life is. Three steps to understanding our purpose. Here's the first one. Pain is included. Pain is included. And I know some of you are just like, okay, I'm out. Don't, I don't want to hear about pain. I didn't come to church to hear about pain. I get that. I get that. Trust me. Nothing would honestly make me happier than to stand up here on this stage and to say, life is fine. Suffering isn't really a problem. All, it's just about your positive attitude. If you're just positive, you don't have to worry about pain. Pain's just in your head, bro. And there's a lot of inspirational, motivational speakers who would say that. Honestly, I'd make a lot more money than I do now if that's what I taught. But... All of us know that that ain't true. That's not true. Do you want to know what? Case in point, the last 13 months. The last 13 months show us that suffering and pain are real. Because over the last 13 months, we have watched our nation, our world, our city suffer. Millions of deaths across the world. Violence and bloodshed and rioting on our streets. There's been a massive increase in mental illness and suicide. Pain is real. It happens. It is part of the human experience because we live in a fallen, broken world. Pain is real. I'm sorry. I can't sugarcoat that for you. I wish it wasn't. And that's part of the reason, like we talked about last week, that Jesus began a work of restoration and reconciliation and healing. But just because he began that work in our world does not by any means mean that that work is finished. He has removed evil, but there's also still evil in our world, right? He has defeated sin, and yet we still wrestle with it. We live in this already, not yet 
we're already experiencing the blessings of Jesus' kingdom, but we also realize, we look out, there's, there's car wrecks, there's pandemics, there's shootings. One day we will see evil completely removed from this earth when Jesus comes back. Till then, we are wrestling with its effects. We're still wrestling and suffering from sin and death. Pain is included, my friends. It is a reality. But I believe that because of this, that through Jesus, our pain becomes a platform to bless others. Our pain can become a platform to bless others. Look at verse 24 again with me. It says, now I, Paul speaking again, rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And not only is Paul, he's acknowledging his suffering. He says he rejoices in it. Like I read verses like this. Can I confess something to you? I'm just like, is Paul just a crazy person? He rejoices in his suffering. Who does that? And you see, Paul is writing this letter from a jail cell. He's not writing this from his nice, cushy home office with a, with a pour over and his nice little like desk lamp. He's not doing that. He's writing this from a jail cell. And scholars, they're split. Some scholars believe he's writing this from a jail cell in the city of Ephesus. Some believe that he's writing this from a jail cell in Rome. Either way, it does not matter. Paul is a man who has suffered more than most of us ever will. And don't get me wrong. That applies to us as American Christians. There are many Christians across this world who are suffering like Paul did, who are in prison. Uh, Christian, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in Iran and China and North Korea, Nigeria, they are suffering. They know what it's like to suffer like Paul. Uh, we don't. But for Paul, he suffered a lot. Like, I mean, like a lot, a lot. From the moment that he met Jesus on that road trip to Damascus, his life was filled with suffering. Everywhere he went, people wanted to beat him up or you know, torture him or imprison him or try to kill him. That was his life after he met Jesus. There's a life that lots of suffering, especially in the first century. And the only way that he survived that pain was because he was able to find a deeper purpose in it. He was able to find a purpose in that pain. And, and honestly, even the same for us, if we can't find some deeper meaning in the midst of the pain that we all experience in our lives, we're gonna to struggle to make it through. Paul says that he is suffering for the Colossian church, which is a little bit strange considering he's never met them. But then he follows it up with an even stranger statement. And this is what he says. He says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions. And, and honestly, this is just one of those statements that you read it and you're just like, Paul, help me. Like, what, what are you talking about, man? Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, and guess what? That's okay. Let me just say this. That's okay. It is okay to read the Bible and to be confused about what it says sometimes. Even the apostle Peter talking about Paul was like, man, I love brother Paul. He's so wise. Sometimes he says things that I don't really understand, but maybe you will. Like, if Peter can be confused by Paul, I think we can. And, and as I was studying this passage this week, pastors, scholars, people have been teaching and studying the Bible for twice as long as I've even been on this planet. Uh, they have different interpretations of what he's talking about in this passage. Uh, you know, it seems like everybody is still a little unsure. However, this is what everyone agrees on. This is what everyone agrees on. This is what we're going with. That we know this, that while Jesus' sufferings on the cross, those were sufficient, that was enough to pay for our sin in full, to atone for our sin. What Jesus suffered, that was enough to pay for our sin completely. However, Paul is saying that he suffered physically in ways that Jesus never did. Jesus' sufferings were 100% enough to cover and pay for and atone for everything that you ever have done or ever will do. Paul is not saying, hey, I'm trying to add my suffering to Christ, like Christ didn't do enough, so I'm trying to help him out. That's not what he's saying. He's just simply saying, I'm suffering too, and I've even suffered things that Jesus didn't suffer on his, in his life. Uh, Paul spent a good majority of his later life in prison. Jesus was never in prison for that long. He's exper Paul has experienced things that Jesus didn't face. And again, he's not saying that his suffering is adding to the work of Christ. That's not it at all. 
What he's doing is he's acknowledging with Jesus, he's, he's acknowledging the fact that if you choose to follow Jesus, you are inviting opposition. If you choose to follow Jesus, to commit your life to the gospel, the good news of Jesus, people are going to oppose you. You are going to experience pain and suffering in this life. Paul is acknowledging that. But I think even beyond just talking about simple persecution, I think that Paul could be referencing another type of suffering here. And I think that's the suffering that simply comes with being a Christian living in a fallen world. Hear me on this. Christians live in between two worlds. We live in between two worlds. We live in between the world of the spirit and the world of the flesh. And those two, those two natures within us are at war. The spirit, God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's enabling your faith. He's enabling you to be obedient to his call to live a life of faith and dependence on Jesus. And yet your sinful nature, the flesh, as the Bible would call it, is trying to pull you in the opposite direction. When that happens, it causes suffering. It causes pain. And that's a battle that all of us must face. All of us must face as Christians. Again, we know that Jesus has defeated our sin, but we will not be completely free from sin until we are with him. And there are multiple types of, of suffering that Paul could be talking about here. Physical suffering. He's suffering physically because of the persecution. He's suffering psychological, psychologically because of just the rejection. His loved ones, his, his family rejected him. He's, he's talking about the spiritual suffering that comes from dealing with sin in your life. But in all of these cases, Paul understood that his pain was not personal. His pain was not just personal. Even for Paul, his pain had a purpose. And Paul sees his pain as a way of sharing in the suffering of Jesus. He says, Jesus suffered, so if I'm going to follow him, I'm going to have to suffer too. And I'm okay with that. And by sharing in the suffering of Jesus, Paul is putting his pain to use in building the church. He's putting his pain to use. Because look at what he says again. Verse 24, he says that he endures pain and suffering for the sake of his, which is Jesus, his body, which is the church. Paul is able to rejoice in his pain because he's using his pain in order to build the church. He can rejoice in the midst of suffering because he's using that pain to build the church, to make it bigger. Because every time this man opened his mouth to spread the gospel, he usually caused a riot or he was kidnapped or he was imprisoned. Every time he would open his mouth to do what I'm doing right now, it didn't end well for him. Like it always ended up hurting him more. People didn't like what he was saying. But he was able to endure the pain that he experienced because he was doing it for the sake of others. He was able to endure that pain, to endure that suffering because he was doing it for the sake of others. Humans are going to experience pain, my friends. You know that. I don't need to tell you, but I'll remind you. We have to experience pain in this life, but when we are serving Jesus, sometimes the pain in our life can become a platform with which to speak in the lives of others, to minister to others. Pain is included in your story. It is. Many of you have been through pain that I couldn't even imagine. We all have a story. We all have hurts in our past, but through Jesus, your pain can become your platform to love others. Your pain can become your platform. Your pain, your story, even your victories over sin can allow you to better speak into the lives of other people who are hurting. You can come alongside them and tell them what Jesus did in you and you can help them walk along that journey. Your pain can become your platform. It is included in your purpose, the, the calling you are walking out. Pain is gonna be part of it, however, because of, our, because of Jesus, our pain can serve a greater purpose. It can serve a greater purpose to build his church. Our pain can be the platform we need to speak into the life of someone else that maybe we wouldn't be able to because we've had pain in our lives that's similar. Our pain can become our platform. And that leads us to the second step that this text shows us about learning about our purpose. And that is that participation is required. Participation is required. Look at verse 25. I become its servant. He's talking about the church. The church is servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. 
the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mercy, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, I, and, and honestly, like I, I talk to a lot of people, I hear from a lot of people, like they just don't feel like they have a purpose in this life. That's hard. That's a hard place to, to be in. I've been there. It's hard to feel like you don't have a purpose, but I'll just be honest. I'll just be honest. For some of you, for some of you, not all, for some, some of you feel like you do not have a purpose because you're not participating in your purpose. You feel like you don't have a purpose. Well, you're not doing anything to participate, to take part in what your purpose is. Think of it this way. I'll use a personal example. So in about a month, I am going on vacation. It's going to be great. I'm excited. Savannah, the kids and I, we are going to the beach. It's going to be incredible. I love being by the beach. But as part of that, I'm just like, you know what? I want to, I want to get in a little bit better shape. You know, I've been kind of trying to, to get in a little bit better shape the last few weeks. I have about a month to go. I'm still going to have that dad bod. It's just kind of always present with me now. I'm just going to have less of a dad bod in California, God willing. But I can talk all day long about getting in better shape and working out. But if I never participate in doing it, it is just that. It is just like, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. That sounds good. You have to participate. Like, I have to actually, you know, cut out certain foods out of my diet, right? I have to actively participate in being healthier. Just like I need to actively participate in that if I want to be healthier and in better shape, you need to actively participate in the calling that God has placed over your life. You need to actively participate. And for Paul, spreading the gospel wasn't a spectator sport. He was not content to sit on the sidelines to let other people do it. Well, but you know, hey, like, I don't need to do anything, guys. You know, we got the rock stars. We got Peter and John and James. Let's let them do it. He was not content to sit on the sidelines to watch other people. No, Paul says that he is a servant. He's a servant of the church because God commissioned him to be one. God commissioned him to be one. Paul realized that serving the church isn't a job he gave himself. That's a job God gave him. And that is the same job that every Christian, every follower of Jesus has had for the last 2,000 years, to build the church. And my friend, do you realize that you've been commissioned to build his church? Do you realize that you've been commissioned to bring people into the kingdom of God? Paul was a pastor. He was a pastor. That's, he's writing this letter from the heart of a pastor. I'm a pastor. Part of my job at Spectrum is to do, like Paul did, to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Because as Christians, we need the fullness of the word of God. We need all of it. We can't just stick to the parts that we like. We can't just stick to Proverbs because that's fun and you've been doing a quiet time in Proverbs for 40 years. There's other books in the Bible, by the way, guys, just so you know. We need the fullness of the word of God. We cannot just stick to the parts that we like, the parts that make us feel good. We need the fullness of the word of God. That is why we preach the word of God every week. We teach the word of God here at Spectrum every week in some way or form. We need the complete word of God. For Paul, for every pastor, and in fact, for every Christian, including you, our job is to preach and to proclaim the good news, the fullness of the word of God. That is our job. You may not be called to teach the word of God from a pulpit. That may not be your calling. For some of you, it may be. However, all of us, no matter whether you want to or not, all of us are called to preach the gospel. We are called to learn and share the word of God with those around us. That is what we are called to do. You may be asking, why do we do that? Why do we have to share the word of God? Why do we have to share the gospel? And Paul says in verse 26, he says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations has been disclosed to the Lord's people. And the Lord's people, your translation may say saints, i.e. you, you have been chosen to make known this mystery to the world around you. You've been chosen to make known, to reveal this mystery to the world 
around you. And Paul says that there's this mystery, something that has been hidden for thousands of years, that, that something happened in the first century that that mystery was then revealed. What was that mystery? The, the revelation of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the Son of God himself, wants to take up residence, wants to have a personal relationship with you. That's the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the mystery. And take that in for a second. It's easy to take that for granted. Jesus, your creator, your redeemer, the one who made you and died for you, desires to have a relationship with you, to live in your heart. And remember, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God specifically revealed himself to the Jewish people. The plan of salvation belonged to the Jewish people. But now, because of Jesus, that plan of salvation is now open to everyone. Jesus opened that offer to everybody. Everybody, Jew or Gentile, who wanted to be part of God's family could be. Now, something that the Old Testament prophets, they knew was going to happen. You see that in Ezekiel and other prophets are just like, I know that one day God's going to bring Gentile, non-Jewish people into his family. But for them, it was still a mystery. They didn't understand what was happening. But Jesus Christ, by what he did, what he said, he revealed that mystery to us. And now, because of that, the mystery's open. We can preach that. We can share that, that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ wants to live inside you. He, he wants to have a real active relationship with you as a person. And he wants to spend eternity with you. But that's not where it stops. A lot of Christians put the period there and they close their Bible. Okay, Jesus loves me. Yay. Yay. That's not where it stops because we have been chosen to make known this mystery, this message to the world. People in your city, people in your family, in your friend group need this message. And you've been chosen to bring it to them. You have been chosen to make this known. Our purpose in life is to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the world. Our purpose is to proclaim Jesus to the world and our participation is required. We have to participate in that. It's not just my job to share Jesus. It's not just Pastor Skip's job to share Jesus. It's yours. That is all of our jobs to share Jesus, to proclaim him to the world. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is not a spectator sport, my friends. Your participation is required. And those around you will miss out on what Paul calls the riches of this message if you refuse to share it. If you refuse to share this message with people you love, they miss out. And that has eternal consequences. Inside faith, true inside belief in Jesus has to become outside living. Inside faith must become outside living. Your faith does not stop with you. Christianity cannot be a spectator sport where you watch other people do what they've been called to do and you just sit on the sidelines. It's not gonna work. If that's what you're doing, that's part of the reason why you feel like your purpose is, is something is wrong. Get involved. Your participation is required. It's needed. Like I said, there are three steps to understanding what our purpose is. Number one, pain is included. Participation is required. And here's the last one. Power is provided. Power is provided. Look at the last two verses of the chapter again. Again, he, Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Your leaders and I, we, we had our leader meeting this last Friday, and we talked about this verse. We talked about this verse because this verse explains why we do what we do. As your leaders, why we do what we do. Everything we do as leaders, as staff, as pastors is to proclaim Jesus to present Jesus to you. That is why we do what we do. We strive to teach you how to follow Jesus so that we can present you 
as mature disciples in Jesus. That's our goal. We are not content with you to stay as baby Christians. We, we want you to be mature disciples, to live the fullest life that Jesus has called you to. We want you to be mature, and that's how the church functions, you see? That's how the church functions. One generation of believers chooses to follow Jesus, and then immediately they turn around and train the generations that follow to follow Jesus. And on and on and on. That's been going for 2,000 years, and that will go on until Jesus comes back. One generation trains another generation, trains another generation, trains another generation. We need each other. Disciples of Jesus, just hear me on this. Disciples of Jesus make more disciples of Jesus. Disciples of Jesus make more disciples of Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus said. Some of his last words on this earth was he says, go and into all the world, into all the world and make converts? No. Make people feel good about themselves? No. Bring a really encouraging message? No. Make disciples. Go into all the world and make disciples. You are not truly a disciple of Jesus if you are not trying to make more disciples of Jesus. I know that's harsh, but it's true. You are not truly living out your calling, your purpose as a disciple of Jesus if you are not actively trying to make more disciples of Jesus. Our faith, our belief, your relationship with Jesus cannot stop here. It cannot stop with you. Paul says that he is strenuously, he strenuously contends with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in him. Meaning, meaning the pow that Paul is only able to live out the purpose that, that God has given him, the purpose that God commissioned him to, because God gives him the power to do that. God supplies the power. He provides the power to fulfill the calling. He does that for Paul, and that is the same for us, my friends. Each of you has been given unique gifts and talents by the Spirit of God. Each of you has. Even if you're just like, I'm not gifted. Yes, you are. Stop saying that. I hate hearing that. I'm, I'm not gifted. I'm not good in anything. Yes, you are. Because God's given you talents you do have a purpose, but with those gifts and talents, God expects you to use those gifts and talents to better his church, to build his church. And again, this may seem harsh. I don't mean it to be, but it is true. Each of you has been given a gift from God or multiple gifts in most cases. You've been given gifts and talents to be used for the betterment of the church, but some of you are sitting on the sidelines, my friends. You're squandering those gifts. God has given you something special, something unique, something that you, only you can do, and you're sitting on the sidelines. You're squandering the gift that God himself has given to you. Part of the vision that we have at Spectrum, you know it. We are city changers. We are city changers. That is your purpose. Each of you, each and every single one of you has the power to change this city. Call me an optimist. Call me naive. I don't care because I believe that. Every single one of you in this room has the power to change this city. That is why God has you in this city. Because he wants you to change it and he's given you the power to do it. And our purpose is to change this city with the mysterious message of Jesus. The message that for 3,000 plus years was hidden and has been revealed that it's our job to share this message with others, with people in this, in this world who are lost, who are suffering, who don't have a purpose and they truly don't feel like they have a purpose. Our job is to come in and stop that because we have a message. That's your purpose. That's your purpose right there. That is the great cause that you've been commissioned to be a part of in this world. And even better, God has provided you everything you need to do that right now. He has provided you every gift that you need to start changing this city right now. And there's lots of causes. There's so much important work, so many important non nonprofits and charity work in this world that needs to be done. And I know that many of you are called to work in those fields and you should work in those fields. 
many, so much important work in this world to be done, but none of those can truly give you the purpose that you need unless you are living according to the design that God has set for you. You can get involved with so many different charities and that's good, you should. But that cannot give you the purpose you are seeking unless you are living according to the design that God has given you. He designed you on purpose for a purpose, on purpose for a purpose. For a lot of you in here, your next step is you need to go through life track at this church. Because as a church, we are here as a family. Spectrum is not just a youth group. We are part of a church. And our church is here. It is our job as a church to come alongside you, to support you, to help you discover what your gifts are. Some of you need to go through life track. You're gonna hear about that in a second. Some of you need to go through life track. Some of you have already done that and you're just not serving. Let's change that. Find me after service. Let's fix that. We got lots of opportunities to serve at Spectrum, to serve across this church. We need you. Like, I'm not just saying that. Like, we need, like, seriously, guys, I need you. I can't do this on my own. My staff can't do this on, on, on their own. Our, our leaders, your leaders, we cannot do this on your own. We need you. This city is too big for me. I'll tell you that. The city ain't too big for you, though. The city is not too big when all of us are working according to the purpose that we've been given. Your purpose in life is to participate in the calling that, that Jesus has placed over your life. That's your purpose. That's your purpose. To participate in the calling that Jesus has placed in your life to proclaim his message, to instruct and make more disciples, to use your pain, your story, as a platform to reach other people. It's your purpose. Each of you has different gifts, different talents, but this is the common thread. Pain is gonna be included. It is included. Most of you, if not all of you, have experienced that. Your participation is required. You cannot sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm begging you, stop. Get out onto the field, guys. We need you, I need you, I need your help. This city needs your help. There are people in this city who will never listen to me, but they will listen to you. People need you. Your story can change the story of somebody else. But the good news is that the power, the power to fulfill that calling has already been provided to you. You have that power. You have all the power you need to live out what God has called you to live. And that's what this passage shows us. Because I believe that, that the mystery of Jesus, that, that mysterious figure, character that we read about in the Gospels and in the Bible, he changed my life, he changed your life, and I believe most firmly that he wants to change the lives of those around you and he wants to use you to do it. So don't miss out on that, my friends. This is an adventure. Serving Jesus is the best adventure that I've ever started in my life. And we need you. We need you. This city needs you, my friends. This church, this family needs you. We will be better if you are using the gifts that God has given you. Let's pray. Father God, once again, we thank you for this, this truth, this message. Thank you for what you are doing in this family. Thank you for all the gifts and the talents that you've given. Everybody in here, God, is mind-blowing. Every single person in here has a purpose. Every single person has a gift and a talent. And God, I pray that you would reveal to them tonight where they need to start using that. 18 or 11, God, you have a purpose in, the, in their life. You want them to be a leader in the city. And I believe, God, that you are gonna change this city through them. Thank you for giving them the power to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So.